And I would like to invite now Charlie from TUB to talk about their IPv6 deployment. So TUB, you guys who came here last year, you might remember they got an award because they have got significant amount of v6 traffic uh, coming out of their ASN. So I'm really happy that Charlie has the That's time it. to come and talk at our event. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? Cool, good. Uh, oh, thank you. Cool. Um, so it's really exciting to be here, actually. Um, I Before we actually did our V6 deployment, I watched a few of uh, these presentations on YouTube, um, which was really helpful. Um, so it's really exciting to actually be here and share our um, IPv6 deployment. Um, so uh, I'm Charlie Huggin. I'm network architect for Tube. Uh, I've been with Tube now uh, for just over four years, uh, since before we actually had any customers uh, until now where we have well over 20,000 customers. Um, and this presentation is going to be about our V6 deployment, uh, which is actually in November 2021 now. Um, but we're going to talk about what went well, uh, what wasn't so good, and uh, where we are today. There we go. Um, so we're a, so who are two first of all? Uh, we're a full fiber ISP uh, or altnet. Um, we're deploying our own fiber network uh, across the south of England. Uh, we also now deploy on City Fiber's network. Um, we are one of the fastest growing altnets in the UK. Um, and it's quite, we have quite an interesting name. So what is Tube? Um, so it's an easy to remember four letter word um, that correlates to the fiber tubes we, we utilize in the ground. Uh, we have the most compelling proposition on the market. Uh, simple products, gig up, gig down, 25 pounds a month. Uh, I, there's not many other ISPs out there that uh, can compete with, with that price point. Um, and it's quite simple, but you can also add uh, a static IP for an additional eight pounds a month. Uh, Want to host anything? Um, and we're quite open. You can use whatever CPE you want. Everything else pretty cool. Uh, so our deployment is regionally focused across the south of England. So we started off in 2019 in Southampton. We since expanded uh, to Camberley, Aldershot. We just started building in Woking, Eastley, and uh, yeah, well over 20,000 connected customers now, and well over 150,000 homes passed. So it's really cool. Uh, so uh, our network, we get into the good stuff. So back in 2019, we started with the. A very rapid deployment. So we went from uh, quite, a, quite a basic network uh, where we just needed to get customers online as fast as possible. So we only had uh, a V4 only network, single router, no resilience, just let's get a DHCP server in there, let's configure some subnets on the core, and let's just have customers just connect to the internet um, and, and get them online as fast as possible. I think we went from no network to a network with live customers in like two months, it was it was insane. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of uh, change since then, um, but basically, it was it was really inefficient. So we had um, yeah, just a DHCP server, we had some gateways configured on the core, and we might have a subnet allocated to each access node, um, and you might only have 20 customers in each node, but they're using a pool of 256 addresses, which extremely inefficient, really fast. So we had to do something about that. So what are the traditional methods of circumventing that? Well, let's deploy CGNAT. But CGNAT really sucks for the consumer. It's not a, uh, let's call it an end-to-end -end service, like uh, what you get with IPv6. So let's make sure before we deploy CGNAT, we get our IPv6 implementation up and running. Um, and also, we, we make sure our customers can actually purchase a static IP. Um, so we got a big big subnet, a big slash 18. We're really lucky to get that. Um, so we got 16,000 addresses. Um, and we deployed BNG as well, which enabled us to um, fully utilize this address space uh, rather than 
just have the gateways configured on the core, really inefficient use. So we could have actually um, continued up until 16,000 subscribers on a network without having to use CGNAT, without having to use IPv6. Um, so it just gave us a bit of time. Um, right, so for our IPv6 deployment, we have some goals. So we wanted to dual stack all our customers, make sure everyone could get a v4 address, everyone could get a v6 address. And we wanted to make sure that everyone could get a static uh, address on their CPE. So it was a static v6 assignment, a static uh, prefix delegation. Um, and that just gives a lot more stability in the LAN. So if, you know, if your CP ever goes offline, you know, you keep the same prefix. You don't have to readdress everything in the, in the local area network. So I think, you know, that's, that's not good. And if we could, we wanted to also simplify the network uh, and remove our DHCP servers um, and just could we do it all from the BNG? And then finally, I was really excited because Tube fits really nicely into 16 bits. So could we get it into our WAN prefixes on all our CPE? That'd be really cool. Um, so, and of course, it'll be easy. V6 has been around forever. Nothing could go wrong. Famous last words. But as we go to the next slide, you can see I love this picture. Everybody has a testing environment. Some people are lucky enough to have a totally separate environment to run production in. Yeah, um, so there were issues um, that were unexpected. We actually are really lucky to have a really good test environment, but it just stuff comes out when you start deploying in production. You realize, oh, there are issues. So our CPE. Um, if you actually disconnected the WAN cable and reconnected it, it would just get stuck and just start dropping leases and dropping V6. So that wasn't good. Bug fix was needed. That took about six months to come out. Our OLT or access nodes, uh, they had a weird bug where you might have one customer here who's getting router advertisements, route advertisements from one VNG. Um, and then route advertisements from uh, another BNG simultaneously, those route advertisements are actually supposed to go to a different customer. So that was chaos. We needed a, a bug fix in our OLT as well. So that is really interesting because you think V6 is going to be easy to deploy. There's not going to be any bugs, but it seems that vendors didn't necessarily or aren't necessarily treating V6 uh, with the same... Um, at the same level as their V4 stack. Hopefully that's changing now, it's 2023. Uh, moving on, so our action deployment, we deployed in November 2021, it was really successful. We peaked at 77% utilization on AP NIC stats, um, so we're really pleased with that. Uh, all our subscribers were given static addressing, so slash 128 on the WAN, slash 56 prefix delegation, and they're all assigned from a big regional pool. Um, to cover the south of England, so we have up to 8 million of them. Um, and those address pools are managed by our OSS platform, uh, which is integrated with our RADIUS platform. And then we did actually manage to remove our DHCP servers, simplify the network, and have it all served from the BNG directly. So that's really cool. Uh, so really successful, we got to 77%, but why haven't we gone higher since? And that's a really interesting one. So there are several factors. 7.5% of our customers, as far as we can see, are using third-party routers. And this sort of harkens back to Jeffrey's presentation where um, you know everything should be default on IPv6, but for these third-party routers, most of them aren't default on IPv6, and you have to actually go in, configure it yourself, and, and activate it. So we, we could actually do better here. We, 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 could, um, we, we need to get some more education out on our website as to how you can actually enable that. Um, but if you're a Tube customer, you're watching this, or you're here in the crowd, uh, and you have a third-party router, just log into it, turn it on. Um, so, uh, and then finally, due to that bug I spoke about earlier with our CPE, um, it's, it's patched, it's fine, but you need to factory reset it uh, to get it fully operational again in some cases. So we're working with our vendor to get that sorted still, um, but we swapped out from that CPE now and we're using a new CPE which is flawless, so we're really happy with that. So it, we should actually see uh, our V6 utilization ramp up over the next couple years. 
So what's next for us? Um, we are launching our new CPE, or it's launched, uh, and so we're hoping our V6 utilization will go up exponentially. Um, and then we want to get that education out on our website so that people can get V6 enabled on their routers. Um, and ultimately, the reason for that, we want to reduce our reliance on CGNAT um, and ideally, eventually, move to IPv6 only. But that's going to be a long time. Um, but beyond IPv6, uh, for our CGNAT solution, we're currently using NAT444. Um, we really, really want to move to MAPT. I would love to move to MAPT. It's a much better solution. But you need support um, all the way from the CPE to the core to actually um, deploy MAPT. So there's a whole bunch of elements with that. You need to make sure your CPE actually has the uh, capability to do that, which a lot of the time requires a more powerful chipset, um, which then increases cost. And then there's a lot of vendors that don't actually support uh, MAPT at the core level. So you've, you're, only, you're limited to a couple options there as well. Um, so yeah, it, I think eventually we will move to MAPT. It's when, not if, but uh, it's going to take time for technology to catch up. So, and then interestingly, just because it's a big buzzword at the moment, we've started deploying 400 gig ZR plus in our core. We actually went live last week. Um, so that was really, really exciting. And then we did manage to get to have inserted into all of our customer address assignments, which is awesome. I'm really happy with that. Just like Facebook, uh, if you do an NS lookup on facebook.com, you get a, a Facebook returned in the address, or you can log into your tube router, and you can see your tube address. So yeah, love that. Um, that's it. Any questions? Charlie, there are questions. You okay, need to take okay. the cube and throw it. Here you go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what, what's the source, the main cause of V4? Is it uh, CPs that don't support it, or is it content providers that don't support V6? Um, so say that again. Is that it, it, is it customers on your network who don't support V6 that are causing the most of the V4 traffic, or is it content providers who don't support V6? That is a very good question. It's definitely a mixture. Um, so there's a lot. Of th I think most content providers these days do support V6. Um, a lot of the issue we have on our network is that you know v6 isn't enabled on a lot of these uh, routers these third party routers so we really need them to be um, you know to get that enabled um, but there are some content providers I think um, that that we'd love to have v6 enabled on like the BBC and uh, um, a couple others so yeah um, it's definitely a, a driver I wouldn't say it's massive but um, yeah thanks okay. There was. Thanks, Charlie. Great talk. Really, really interesting. Tom Thanks. Hill from BT. Um, I had a really curious idea about whether or not, and this is, it, uh, yeah, this came up in conversation the other day. Have you had a situation where you've been able to compare an IPv4 outage and an IPv6 outage in the context of how many customers ring up and get angry about it? That is so interesting. I love that question. We had an IPv6 outage a few months ago. Bizarre. So uh, we did a core router upgrade, and uh, our v6 network went down uh, for a few days before. Yeah, I know. I know. We it, we noticed from AP Nick stats. Um, <laughs> um, no one noticed. There might be a monitoring problem. <laughs> there is. Uh, so since that uh, since that arose, we we put in place some monitoring for that, um, it, for exactly that reason because it, it, you know we didn't notice it. We should notice it. Um, so that's in place now. Um, but to your point, um, I was shocked that no one called up about it because. Uh, to be fair, we're still we're a big network now. We've got well over twenty thousand customers. Um, so, and we do have some evangelists on our network, um, but perhaps they don't have <laughs> monitoring either. <laughs> we're all running third party routers. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're running third party routers. Grim. Good throw. <laughs> oh. 
Good throw. Um, I'm one of your customers and a general network pest. I'm one of these people who does run a third party router. Really? Does support IPv6. So we probably, need to, um, we probably need to talk about that later. But there are two things I wanted to ask. Um, so Tom just actually brought up an interesting question about the V6 outage, and I'm wondering why I didn't notice it. I was probably away, so I need to look at my monitoring to see that. But have you had any strange complaints from customers about IPv4 CGNAT performance? Or do they normally just not bother calling? Um, if they have an, a, a CGNAT issue, um, no, it just works. So our CGNAT boxes are really good. If, if they have, uh, so the, the, the latency is completely negligible. It's not noticeable. Um, but if, um, you know, if, if customers do call up about CGNet, it's mostly just because they want to host something over V4, you know, just, I've got a CCTV camera, I want it to be on V4, so we give them a static IP address. Um, so yeah, it's fairly straightforward. We haven't had, you know, v, v, CGNet's been really good, uh, our deployment anyway, so yeah. Okay. And the other thing I was gonna say was, I'm pleased that you're talking about user education for third party stuff. However, what I found with it is, it's enabled, and it's there waiting for it, but the, there's a tick box you need to do to basically set, um, not wait for an RA on the tube network. And that makes everything just work. Yeah, interesting. We'll have to talk about that afterwards. Yep. But um, yeah, it, it really depends on the router that, that's being yep. used. So it's not just actually enabling it, it's knowing how to configure it. So I think 100%, 100%. Is, the user education is important here. It's very important. It's interesting as well because there's a lot of manufacturers that do things ever so slightly differently. Um, so there are caveats and then it's about making sure each of those caveats, you know, how do you cater to all those manufacturers on your website? Um, so it's something that we need to do. We need to look into it. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone.